So like I said, um, this is not quite a LGBTQ plus 101 where we'll go over about sexuality and gender and terminologies. Oh, rather, we're going to talk about the, um, the complex nature of what those of us in the LGBTQ plus community um, go through uh, day to day and kind of peel back the layers of the onion, if it were, um, and understand what those intersectionalities are and you know what what creates these problems. I hope everyone can see the screen well. For whatever reason, it looks kind of jumbled on my end. Um, For some reason, I'm seeing like your controls are blocking your PowerPoint. <laughs> OK. My laptop's being a little bit slow right now, so just bear with me for a moment. OK, here we go. Yeah, I'm not sure what the little box is that's exposing your desktop. <laughs> oh, you probably don't see it on your side, but I think we see it on our side. So it's just, wow. uh, I don't know what the little box is. Oh, this is interesting. Maybe stop and start it again. Yeah. Never happened. This has never happened to me on Zoom before. Yeah, we had some few weird problems earlier. Are you able to stop the share? Stop the share. Yeah, I did. Wow, the share is still stuck. Weird. Wow, the share is still stuck. Oh, wow. I hope everyone can hear me because. Yeah, I can hear you. Um, but your screen share is frozen. Yeah. It's... <laughs> this is, this is, wow. This is. Okay. Um, wow. Wow. okay. <laughs> it's what? The screen share finally stopped. Oh, I'm glad on your end. So I guess there is a delay with your laptop. Um, we can see if you can start it again. Let me clear up the. Unless you need to close some stuff. Well, that's um. Deeply apologize for this technical issue, everyone. Um, we will get through this. Okay, it looks like we're losing some people. Wow, a lot of people just fell off. Camila, you're now the host. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what happened. Uh, well, AJ comes back. Should we kind of have an open discussion about intersections? Uh, sure. Um, try to figure out. It looks like we lost about 10 people. 
So I just want to make sure um, if they can get back in. Uh, Camila, are, are you seeing anyone trying to get back in? I only let Sharice back in. Um, I didn't see anyone else wait in a waiting room. Okay. I'm still waiting to see if, if, if AJ comes back. <laughs> yeah, his computer definitely locked up. Mm. He might have to reset his whole computer in my case. I am going to walk away to get some water. I'll be right back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's always interesting technology. So just out of curiosity, who all here identifies as LGBTQIA, Two-Spirit, et cetera? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> I'll start. This is David. I identify as gay or queer. Um, I feel queer is more comfortable for me politically, but I'm comfortable with people calling me gay, so. Anyone else? <laughs> oh, and I'll add that I'm cisgender. Okay, in the chat, Sharice uh, says, parent of a non-binary child. Okay. And AJ's coming back in. Okay. Let's try this one more time. And I will send the host back to you. Thank you. Oops. Okay. All right, here we go. So now we got everything up and going. I'll just skip through a couple of these. These are quick inter, introductory type of things. And like I said before, um, we had technical issues. So what, why, are, why am I using this term? Uh, Queer geographies, queer and trans geographies. Um, as you can see here on your screen, uh, I'm, I'm looking at this from a very geographic um, perspective in, a, in an academic discipline of geography uh, as, a, as a human geographer. Uh, we, we look at uh, culture, we look at politics, we look at society and what people do in 
spaces and places and everything. And so we, we look at these connections um, socially, culturally, politically, um, and, and spatially of, of, the, of the physical environment. And that's like the one neat thing about uh, geography is that it's very it's a very interdisciplinary um, academic field, but even as um, organizers and activists and campaigners, you know, we can even look at geography or use geography to our advantage to understand um, LGBTQ rights um, and other issues that related to for, for those of us in that community you will hear me often you'll probably hear me say queer uh in this presentation from time to time i identify myself as such i also use um they them pronouns uh and i use queer as more of an umbrella term and i know a, a certain generation um, may not uh, appreciate that as much as my generation and the younger generation have used it as much um that's just how we identify as and everything. So again, with um, using geography, and you know, I'll try not to uh, have a lot of academic talk through this session, but I just want to give us some sort of orientation, if it were, uh, on why it's the title of this um, presentation as such. So when we talk about space, there's this idea called spatial justice. And we, uh, a few folks have written about spatial justice and it's, it's linking space and social justice and in order to analyze the impact of rural, regional and urban planning specifically. And th this photo is of a, a pride parade that happened in Uganda. And, and, I'll, and I'll touch on this a little bit more. Um, per pertaining to the, the Ugandan Pride March and everything. But we, we, we talk about spatial justice in terms for queer and trans folk because there's, like other uh, cultural identities, you know, we're all interwoven and, you know, we're part of this larger community that has no physical. Uh, boundaries, you know, unlike Dallas, Chicago, Milwaukee, New York, Albany, um, Carson City, you know, those that have physical bounds, you know, they're political bounds, but there's, they have boundaries to it, even environmental um, in geography, you know, we, we have bounds in that capacity, but for, for, for those of us, you know, we have like no real physical bounds. When we talk about the LGBT community, we're talking about that in both urban and rural uh, spaces and places and everything. So when we talk about spatial justice in geography, you know, we're, we're thinking about, you know, the existence um, for our community and the social problems and the, the, the intersections of the social problems that the LGBTQ plus community like, faces. So this gives you a little bit of an idea um, where I'm coming from when it comes to you know this first portion of this presentation, and so we, we can talk about some of the bigger problems, and, and one of it's development. And when we think about development, you know, I'm I'm talking about regional planning, city planning, rural planning. You know, well, that's the kind of development I'm talking. And whether you live in a big city or a village, a rural village, you know, there's a lot of overlapping issues that go along with that. Um, and some of those things in development, and these are not just limited to these four things, these are just some of the examples. Uh, so like community spaces, you know, uh, the, wherever you go, you know, the LGBT community needs some sort of like community space, you know, that could be for a long time, those, those have been bars. Um, another while it was public parks. And then for some time, you know, we try to develop our own community centers, um, LGBT centers, and some of them 
had a creative names like the center in Halstead, like in, in Chicago, or some of them are just uh, right there, you know, the LGBT center of Dallas. You know, so we need some sort of like community space where, you know, we can just come gather, be part of our own community, have conversations with our community, just kind of that, you know, social gathering and bonding that we need and everything. And then, you know, development does come with gentrification. Um, and when I'm talking about, when I say gentrification, I'm really talking about uh, attracting people to a certain area that changes the character of a neighborhood or a part of town. And that raises an economic value, which pushes out a working class um, community out so a more affluent community can come in. You know, I mean, we've, seen gentr we've all seen gentrification at some level um, where we reside in. Uh, accessibility is another one. You know, we want to make, you know, our uh, cities um, accessible. Um, and if we don't have the accessibility, you know, we have to talk about, you know, how can we provide some sort of justice when it comes to that accessibility? And that could be transportation, that could be going to a grocery store, that could be going to a hospital or a social service or wh whatever the case is. You know, we, we need to talk about accessibility in development. And then when we also talk about development, it's that understanding of lived experiences as well. And that's like one of the big key things in spatial justice is that understanding lived experiences in space, in places. So what is the understanding of lived, the lived experiences for uh, LGBTQ plus folks when it comes to say urban spaces? You know, this is a photograph of Boys Town neighborhood in, in Chicago. You know, and this is like one of the things I was kind of alluding to earlier about when it comes to development and everything. And, you know, when, when you see urban areas, you know, these are some of the things that you, we would probably see. Um, we need to talk about neighborhoods, you know, are we going to develop certain neighborhoods? And, and again, I'm just going to pick on Boys Town for a moment. I forgot at the moment how Boys Town got started, but what I do know living in Chicago was that there was really trying to draw folks to Boys Town right there on Halstead Street. And then that became, you know, developing clubs, developing bars, having restaurants that are uh, LGBTQ plus owned, so forth and so forth. And so you create that neighborhood and it, that was, there was that attraction. And then some have, not just Boys Town, but other places have kind of gravitated towards certain parts of town that became like a, its own little neighborhood, you know? And I've seen that around the Midwest also where people just started moving to one part of town and that became a neighborhood. So with neighborhoods, you know, it's a really important factor, um, but you also have a problem like in Boys Town situation, you know, create gentrification as well. Um, homelessness is an issue um, in ur urban areas. Uh, we all seen homelessness in our various places if we live in urban urban areas. And it's, it's really uh, impacted for, for those of us also in the community. And as well as public restrooms, you know, we, we've seen legislation of, you know, putting a halt to particularly trans folks using public restrooms um, and then creating safe spaces also. Of, you know, we don't have enough safe spaces for those of us who, uh, you know, we do, the LGBT community does have um, a problem with substance use disorder. You know, and so it'd be nice to have safe spaces for those who can safely do injections um, with services that's right there for them. And as well as, you know, there's some of us who also uh, practice, um, you know, sex work and having safe spaces for that as well. So it's, it's having 
those kinds of safe spaces as well as safe spaces where folks can just come to and just be heard and listen to the concerns that we have and having that access one more time of addressing those concerns and then how we can solve those kinds of injustices that's happening in, in urban areas. Now, rural areas is a little bit more challenging as someone who's living in rural spaces um, most of their lives, um, currently in one right now. This in this photograph is a, a four-way intersection in Iowa City, in Iowa, or excuse me, I think it's um, Cedar Rapids, in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Um, and this was a very controversial thing that happened there. Um, they just wanted to do this uh, during the month of Pride, and then the city said, you know, well, not the city, but the state of Iowa wanted to say, you know, you can't do this, you know, um, and they wanted to take away this. And there was a big public outcry saying, no, we need to keep this. And that's one of the various issues that happen in rural areas. Again, these are not just restricted to these four things, but some of the things that I have observed, like housing, you know, there's very limited housing in rural spaces. If you have a town of 10,000 people, you know, you're going to have very limited, limiting homes. With that said, uh, three years ago, NPR put a report out that 5% of, 5% of the rural, popula of rural population is made up of queer and trans folk. 5% three years ago. So it was 19, uh, 2019. And there has been a, a slight trend upward to increasing that 5%. You know, so a lot of folks are live, moving out of urban areas and coming to urban spaces. And so this becomes that challenging of housing. And uh, that sometimes means that people says, well, we don't want these kind of folk near me, so put them somewhere else, you know? So it could be this underlying, uh, redlining going on and saying, you know, they need to be on that side of town or having this outcry to realtors or cities saying, you know, why are these folks coming here? You know, and, 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 that, and that has happened, you know. Uh, transportation, there's some rural areas that just don't have mass transportation like bigger cities do. The town in, town in right now, we have no buses at all. So, so it's a very car dependent society here. So if you need to go somewhere, you know, it has to be by car. And if your town doesn't have a service, it may be 15 minutes either direction or something, or even 45 minutes. Um, and I'll get to a little bit later on also, but like social services, like I worked directly with uh, queer and trans adolescents at a drop-in center. And there's some of the youth who needed like um, Planned Parenthood assistance or other kind of assistances. And so we, we couldn't provide transportation. So they had to rely on someone else, a friend, maybe a parent that they trusted more to go to Aurora, Illinois, which is a 45 minutes east of here. So they came to say, hey, you know, take this bus and that will take you to Aurora or even a train, um, take the train and go that way. So, so you may have a lack of transportation areas. Jobs is also an issue, uh, depending on the rural space, that means not many jobs as other places, which means your, your wages may be lower than expected and everything. And again, community spaces. Just like urban spaces, uh, community spaces is almost a dime a dozen. You know, you may not have a LGBTQ center at all, you know, um, so you may have to rely on a bar, um, a queer and trans friendly faith organization. Uh, it might be someone's house, which for the longest time that was the 
that pertained to my friends and I, you know, we had to go to someone's house just to hang out and be that community space. So imagine like 15 of us in, in a small house, you know, and just being there on a weekly basis. So um, again, these are just some of many things that are an issue when it comes to real issues. So again, you know, as I said earlier, there's um, a lot of other intersectional issues when it comes to queer and trans geographies, immigration being one of them. And what, so how is this an issue? Well, again, we have foreign policy. You know, we, we all know that the U.S. foreign policy sucks, which means that we may intervene in countries in Latin America or in Africa or anywhere in the global south really and we may have folks wanting to flee those areas to come to the United States and we all know that border policy is also not the greatest um, so so just imagine Oh, excuse me. So just imagine, you know, trying to come to the United States and you're fleeing because the United States is intervening in Brazil or Argentina or uh, Sudan or, or wherever we're at, you know, and trying to come to the United States because we've because they've heard there are better public policies and I'm using that in quotes and using that term very loosely and coming in here and trying to seek asylum political asylum and they just can't a lot of them go to, go to ice as well you know there are pe people who've been to the to to the mexican border and have gone to ice and that's just in mexico when they're at even in new york or california or wherever else they come to by plane and they come to the United States, you know, they, they get targeted and get sent to an ICE detention center. And we'll get to, as you just saw, the prison industrial complex a little bit later. So they're coming here because of foreign policy. They're coming here because they want to seek political asylum because of the foreign policy that we have in the United States um, and try and meet certain needs. You know, they might want to come here because they want to have a better life. They want to come here because they might have heard healthcare is better than the United States. They've come here because of whatever reason. So they come here to find out that it's not the greatest. And in fact, you may be ending up going to prison or you may be turned to go back to your country. So just imagine that, that you're trying to flee and you just want to seek shelter, a safe space, a sanctuary, but you can't. You either go through the prison restaurant complex or you get deported back to the area you came from and you gotta deal with those consequences because outside the United States, other places criminalizes the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, there's places in Africa where if, if you are open about it, you'll get sent to prison and you will be executed. Other places, it's a long-term prison sentence. So, I mean, th these are the realities that people are trying to get away from. The prison does run complex. Um, I can tell you stories from people who have been in the inside. And I can tell you uh, it, it's being queer and trans in the prison system, um, like, like any other issue, it's, it's not the greatest, you know? Um, but for one of the things, you know, if, if you've ever been inside a prison, uh, I mean, majority of the time they are gendered population. So you have a female population and a male population. So if you, so imagine if you're, if you're trans and you're at a 
a minimum security state prison and you are a trans woman, you don't go to women population, female population, you go to male pop, male, male population. And this is the policy of, of the prisons. So you have, you have debt to deal with. You have public and private prisons that have their own policies. So as we all know, public prisons have to abide by state and federal policy. Private prisons, they can do whatever the hell they want. You know, so whether you're the California, the California Corporation of America or the GEO, um, private prison company, you know, they set their own policies, you know, so they may abide to some public policy, but for the most part, they abide to their own. Uh, and then having that access of needs, some prisons don't have that access, whether it comes to healthcare or social service, um, where the traumas that they have to deal with inside, they can't talk to a counselor. A lot of them don't have that. Um, if they get injured, there's no doctor to see them. And if they do, they'll just patch them up just to put them right back in, in with the population. And the, they're solitary. So most policies, prisons policies, particularly if you're trans, that you know we can't send you to the female population and we know possibly we can't send you the men population. So the best option is to put into solitary confinement, not just for a short duration of time, but for the entire duration that you are sentenced for. That is the option. It's not just a minimum or federal um, security prisons, uh, even those like county prisons, Dane County, in Madison, um, that is their policy. If you are trans, they are automatically go to solitary confinement, no questions about it, you know, because that's they think that is um, lesser of two evils. So they'd send them to solitary confinement. And I remember one person there who was sentenced for 36 months, and they're already in six months in to their sentencing in, the, in Dane County. So like this is like a, one of the few, one of the many items that goes on with the prison industrial complex. Health and Human Services, um, while that has been better over the years, um, we still have a long ways to go, um, in my professional opinion as a social service professional. Um, and I'll touch on the image to your left, um, Lori's Hospital, but Lori's Hospital, Children's Hospital in Chicago, as you can see, and they're great in some ways. I've said, I've told youth they should go there for checkups or what have you, but there's also some problems with Lori's Hospital. The project, Project of Quad Cities, uh, an organization I, I've worked with alongside from time to time near me. These are just a couple of examples, but with health, health and social services, there's foundational knowledge that's just not there. You know, a, a lot of them are trying to, if not they say that they are, they're all about it. They're all about our community, but just the intake form alone, you know, when you go into a hospital or you go to a social service, you know, that the intake form that says, you know, your name, you know, your age, your weight, you know, some of that intake information, they don't even have some of that foundational knowledge of what is your sexual ident identity, you know, your, your gender, you know, it's just male, female, not trans woman, trans man, non-binary, gender fluid, you know, they don't have that, you know, I've had to go and conduct train sessions for social workers and counselors to, to get them to understand this foundational knowledge. 
and how to do that with their own intake forms as well as how to create better policies in their organizations. Uh, the other thing is ex expansive services. Proud of the Quad Cities um, in 2018, it was just around four counties. Now they expand into the whole Northwest corridor of Illinois. And as I talked to the director um, this past week, you know, it's like, it's great, you, you expanded, but you're now in rural areas. So how are you expanding service into areas that don't have funding in these areas? You know, what are you gonna do when you have certain cities that say they're, they understand our community, but they don't do anything to help the community. So what are you gonna do as an organization? So these are issues. Data, there is a lack of data out there when it comes to health and human services. It's getting better. Um, there's been some data collected over the years for sure, but we still don't have any really strong numbers when it comes to um, sexually transmitted um, diseases or even now known as STIs. Um, we don't have any real numbers as to actual LGBTQ plus population numbers. Um, we, we don't even have those kind of things. And just the census alone, if you look at the last census, you know, we've kind of been taken out of that information. So even health and human services can't even collect that data to understand the data that they have to correlate it in order to understand what things are happening in certain areas, which leads to public policy. You know, we just need, to, we just need better public policy when it comes to a national health care service, I would even say a national social service agency, you know, so we need, need better public policy when it comes to health and social services. Oh, and the issue with Lori's Hospital, as great as they can be, um, they also do recorrective surgery. Um, so in, in other words, you know, when a child's born at Lori's, um, they will already predetermine what the gender of that child is. So they will do corrective surgery and they've had a history of doing that over the years. So that has always been addressed, continually being addressed, I should say. And that's like, that's one of the other issues that you have hospitals who think they know best without having that foundational knowledge, like I said, and they start doing like corrective surgery um, without even consent with family members or um, anyone else when it comes to that, or legal guardians. Uh, education um, is another issue. Um, the, the person to your right, um, that's not a green <laughs> at all. That's actually my former state representative. Uh, her name is Tony McCombie. She's a Republican. You're probably saying, AJ, why do you have a Republican on here? Well, and here's why. Uh, it, Tony McCombie has done a great job of saying, even to my face, that, you know, I'm for my constituents. And if they're part of the LGBT community, then I'm for them. But this is the same person who has staunchly opposed. Uh, bills for inclusive sex education, who has voted against and openly again um, expressed not having LGBT history being taught in um, high school, middle school and high school age levels, you know, and this is her and others in Illinois and, all, and across the United States that we have seen who have gone out of their way to again, using their political platform to block and create other legislation to not address um, issues when it comes to the LGBTQ plus LGBTQ plus population, particularly in education, because without any inclusive sex education, we don't even have a generation to understand just sex by itself. You know, it's just 
um, heterosexual sex education and not learning, not just about that, but also not learn about um, sexually transmitted diseases um, or having safe sex or other options when it comes to sexual, when it comes to sex. Um, there's no, well, there's no, but it's also, we need to improve our um, policies in the schoolhouse, um, which means we need to get people elected onto boards of education, um, which also means we need to work with students and do some youth organizing to do actual reform in the schools, as well as community residents to actually create real reform when it comes to education as well. Um, and I'm really big on the idea of a radical pedagogy as praxis and by pedagogy as it means like a teaching approach. And by praxis, you know, how do we use teaching approaches to create actionable items. And I'm, this is really big with bell hooks. Um, if you don't know bell hooks, just Google her sometime. Uh, I, one of my favorite books to read um, and I still read it from time to time as teaching to transgress. I encourage you all to check that book out. Um, and that really pertains to radical pedagogy of practice as Bill Hooks and, and Paula Freer is the foundational person when it comes to radical pedagogy. Um, Paula Freer, um, uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed is another book you should read also. Um, and then windows and mirrors curriculum, what I mean by that, um, curriculum should be windows and mirrors. So in other words, it should be a mirror in so far that it should be reflective of our history. So whether it's about black history, brown history, Asian Pacific Islander history, LGBTQ plus history, working class history, women's history, um, that should be a mirror. That curriculum should be reflective, you know, so the educator needs to design curriculum that's reflective of the students that are in there, not just about history, but even other forms of curriculum, which I can do a whole workshop on that alone. And then a window, meaning that providing a window for others to look at as a snapshot for them to understand, which is why when we did pass LGBT history in Illinois, that was my one of my big things when I went around to uh, four counties in Illinois and 20 schools I went into to talk about this very thing, that there are students who are who needs LGBT history because like black history and other histories, you have students there that need to hear this, who needs the inspiration. So you have that generation to forge more paths for us to create the kind of progress that we need. So we need to talk about not just the Stonewall uprising. Uh, we need to talk about the Compton riots and the Tenderloin district of San Francisco. Uh, we need to talk about Marsha P. Johnson. We talk about Silvio Rivera. We need to talk about um, Alan Turing, we need to talk about even someone like Abraham Lincoln, where, you know, we're seeing historically that he might have been bisexual, if not gay. Um, so, you know, we need to, you know, and I'm talking about history now, you know, there's other things we need to talk about, you know, sociology, um, cultural studies, you know, and there's a few other things that we can talk about this as well, but these are some of the things that we need to address within education. Now, those are the problems. And, and I'll try to package it up here where, you know, where these problems stem from. Well, it stems from one of them is neoliberalism. And as you can see on the screen here, you know, neoliberalism is an, is, is an ideology as well as an economic model that relies on private public partnerships. Um, think about the Augusto Pinochet's of the world in Chile. Think of Robert Reagan, think of Margaret Thatcher, um, 
think of, you know, what has gone on in New Orleans um, after Katrina. You know, these are just some examples of many things that are happening right now. Uh, Naomi Klein has talked about this in her book, um, Shock Doctrine. Um, and so check out that um, if anyone else needs other text examples, just you can see my email here on Zoom, just email me and I will send you a reading list or, or more of topics on, on this. So, so neoliberalism as a policy, you know, is one of these issues that really feeds into these things. You know, it feeds into gentrification. It really feeds into having prisons. It feeds into creating the kind of educational policies that we have. It feeds into, you know, uh, immigration issues, you know. So neoliberalism is one of those fuels. The other one is rain, what's considered rainbow capitalism, which stems from neoliberalism. So when I say rainbow capitalism, I'm talking about the targeting the inclusion of the a queer and trans community, which acquires the suffi sufficient purchasing power to generate a marketed focus. So we start seeing this around Pride Month. You know, we start seeing, as you can see here, you know, Nike having the pride flag or um, Absolute Vodka having a pride flag, you know, see all the commercials, you know, so there's a little consumerism going on here. There's a lot of other things happening. And so you start having the private sector really capitalizing on the LGBT community and getting them to say, hey, you know, if you do this, if you get involved in the private sector, be entrepreneurs, have your own businesses, you too can have the real power through capitalism in order to get what you need. And a lot of folks have bought into this over the years, I would say. I would say since the 80s, this is, has been going on within our community. So, so rainbow capitalism ties into neoliberalism. There's also heteronormativity, you know, the idea that there's a breakdown, you know, when it comes to sex assignment, gender identity, gender expression, sexuality, relationships. This is what heteronormativity does. You know, it creates this norm, normative culture that has a very heterosexual um, focus to it. So we see this a lot in society. Um, and and we've, we've, some of us have experienced this on many levels. Um, we can even probably point to various moments in history where this happened. And so you have that. Then you have what I would consider its cousin, which I will say this will probably be a little bit more controversial for some. So this idea of homonormativity, and, and I apologize for the uh, description here, but that's not the description of it, but homonormativity um, is really this idea that you have folks in the queer and trans community that dictate this is what it means to be gay, to be lesbian, to be trans, to be whatever. And that too has been going on for quite some time. Homonormativity is tied into neoliberalism. It's tied into rainbow capitalism. And the images that you see here or a couple of pop culture references, uh, Modern Family, the show Will and Grace. There was a movie called Stonewall. And in Stonewall as a movie really does show that example because it shows the, the, the protagonist in the film and other supporting protagonists um, as these white folk in the Greenwich Village neighborhood of New York that they're the ones who got involved with Stonewall and therefore it's, it's these folk. Really, well, in reality, 
They didn't even talk about Marsha P. Johnson. They didn't talk about Sylvia Rivera. They didn't talk about anyone else. And those are the ones who were leading the uprising at Stonewall. Um, so black and brown folks, trans folks, not white gay men. They were there, don't get me wrong, but they were not the ones totally involved as, as terms of like a core leadership. Um, so you have that, and then you have organizations like Human Rights Campaign, um, PFLAG, um, other organizations that kind of also dictate on how we vote. HRC and PFLAG have a tendency to say, you know, we gotta vote for Democrats because they got our back. And they will send people to like lobby training, advocacy training, led by Democrats, and you have to get on board because the Democratic Party is the one that has our back. Well, we have a Lavender Caucus in the Green Party, and I would say that caucus has more of our back than the Stonewall Democrats do as their caucus. Um, so this is what homo homonormativity looks like here. And the other thing is the patriarchy. As we know, it's a social system that which men dominate over others and 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 then you know another criticism is that we have like white gay men who are part of that patriarchy at times that controlling over you know control over society and saying you know lesbians can't do anything and sure as hell bisexuals can't say anything um so so you have this going on also So how do we fight these things? And, uh, and, and I'm gonna, these are the last three things I'm going to talk about. So we, there's social movements, and we know some of these social movements that have gone on over the years, the Liberation Front, ACT UP, the Dyke March. Um, earlier I showed you about the Uganda Pride March. This, this is the other photo of that. Um, and that was 2015, I believe 2015 was the first one, um, again, in a nation that criminalizes um, the LGBT community like death. So they held a pride march in a nation that will sentence them to death. So it takes social movements to address these issues as activists, but as organizers is trying to build relationship with community members, our own community and accomplices to pass the real reforms that we need to be doing in order to have the kind of progress we need to see in society. Um, electoral action. Um, the person on your left um, is Jason West. Some, some of you who've been in the party a little bit longer may know of him. He was the mayor of New Plouts, New York, the village there. Um, I don't believe, I could be wrong, I saw David Dunan come on, so David, you may correct me here, but I don't believe he's he's gay. But what I liked about Jason, and I've talked with Jason before, is that when he was the mayor, he was the first mayor in New York when New York um, didn't have legalized gay marriage, same-sex marriage, marriage equality. So Jason, using his position of power, uh, married folks right there on the steps. They're at New, new Plots, you know, and, and that was big news at that time, you know, and he was a Green out of the New York Green Party. And so we need to elect folks like Jason to do those kinds of things as well. The person to your right, um, I just threw it on there as more as a representation, not just to say, oh, it's the AJ show. R rather, that I, even though I've never been elected into office, I've been appointed to office, um, been, been part of a city commission in City Hall. But more importantly, I feel, um, I think we can also be creative in our electoral action by getting folks elected onto you know, cooperative boards, um, being elected into other community boards, you know, so while using 
politics to our advantage in order to create the kind of policies we want to see is something we should think about as a strategy, not the strategy, but a strategy. I think we also need to be thinking about how can we elect folks, if not appoint folks, into government entities as well as in community places in order to get the kind of reform we need to be seeing and everything. So we really need to think about what does electoral action look like, you know, instead of just thinking of it as this one thing that has to be federal, state, and municipal elections. It can be that, but I think we need to expand out what electoral action looks like. And I'll just end with this by saying scholar activism. What do I mean by that? I feel that we as activists and organizers need to bridge our work with folks in academia. There are professors, there are researchers out there who really, really want to work in our communities. For the longest time, yes, the academy has done a lot of great deal of being part of the apparatus of the state as well as oppressing its communities and everything and we can talk about many examples of that that said there are academics and researchers who are deemed as activist scholars i deem myself as an organizer scholar who really try to create <clears throat> research approaches like participatory research action like you see on your left, that image there, to work with communities and train them, educate them on how to create um, effective focus groups, um, how to utilize the resources that they have um, for free for community members to advance their goals, um, use their space as a safe space in order to talk about advancing certain goals or advancing policy um, and how to get certain people in the academy into certain places so they can be part of that um, group to detour what higher ed higher education institutions are doing in communities and then you have folks like to your right um toyin who's um part of uh, university in London, University City in London. And this is him um, in a very royal event in front of the Queen and then Tony Blair. And this was during an event where um, the, the Queen was talking about, you know, UK's history and everything and Toy and wanted to address on how it's the United Kingdom's very problem of the slave trade. And the Queen and Parliament has been that very problem. And Toyin to this day, who I know quite well, um, uses his um, position as a scholar and work with like Black Lives Matter in the UK and elsewhere to advance the kind of goals and everything. So like these are three things, social movements, some sort of electoral action, scholar activism, um, in order to, you know, advance issues and address the concerns I just mentioned moments ago. That said, are there any questions folks have? Um, this may be, how do you see um, religious spiritual communities, but other such community groups? Um, I know uh, I have a, a friend who is a scholar, um, does work on um, queer, queer deities. <laughs> Teach people about different queer deities. Um, and does other work to like expand people's ideas within their religious, whatever their particular religion is. Yeah. 
so your question is how to work with faith faith organizations yeah right? and how does that work is that as part of a geographic social geographic yeah effort yeah so i will preface to say this um you're talking I, I am someone who if you would have asked me this question probably 08 maybe 07 like like when I just joined the green party i would tell you david no fucking way there's there's no way in hell to do that now <laughs> um i have been shown by other faith leaders and organizations that they do mean well they're not like the Westboro Baptists of the world or anyone else like that. <clears throat> and there are those folks, don't get me wrong. There are those folks and they continue to be those folks. There's one not, not too far from me where I'm sitting right now, where there's a Baptist church that has said on YouTube that they wouldn't mind um, killing someone um, right there in town. So in order to work with faith organizations, one, it's, it's gotta be that trust. So that's the onus on the faith leader. That's the onus on the faith organization. So in terms of, again, a geographic sense, we know where for faith organizations' positions are, you know, because in any space, faith organizations um, really do have control as to what goes on in communities. A lot of faith leaders sits on various community boards. A lot of faith leaders have the ear to other folks who assume they have power. So what we need to be doing, you know, if we have um, faith leaders that are, are on our side, and I have some of those friends um, over the years, and um, I rely on them a lot. Um, we've had many weekly phone calls um, where I still have concerns, and they address those concerns, and they come to me about, you know, issues they have in their church or in their districts and everything. So I think there's room um, for us to work with faith, faith organizations, but there needs to be that trust, which means we have to have those kind of one-on-one -on -one conversations with faith leaders, those lay leaders, and see where they fit into our agenda when it comes to local issues, state issues, federal issues, international issues, you know, so uh, so I guess to answer your question, you know, it, there is room for it. We just somehow have to work with them, which means we have to be on that same page. You know, this is where I'm coming from. Where are you coming from? And we got to have those difficult conversations. And if we, we just do. So having difficult conversations and trying to build trust and relationship from there. Uh, well, I think I found it's always good to find out for many people, it's important uh, to know that they that they can be a part of a community, some type of community, just for the social interaction. Yeah. And yeah. so, whether it's a Unitarian <laughs> church or it's, or it's something that's more traditional, um, or if it's a, a you know, I know I'm an openly gay imam. Um, I know openly gay. Um, covens, um, queer covens, um, trans covens. I know trans pastors in Presbyterian and in Lutheran churches and in other churches locally. Um, and so I think there's a lot more, uh, but I think it is, it's obviously it's a, a part where there's not really a lot of directly political work to do, um, except within the religious politics. Yeah. Um, and then hope that too that those people can be engaged in the broader political movement um even if you're not a part of that religious group sometimes they're good places to work with um and even for for native communities um you know a two-spirit powwow and, and being able to connect with um not just the tribal aspect of that but also the native religious aspect of that uh, in many cases where two-spirit people were highly valued. No, absolutely, absolutely. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, is, is it is it Charisse? Yeah, Charisse. Um, 
Go ahead. Well, I was just kind of responding to David. I, I do like to remind people that not all religions are Judeo-Christian Islamo based. Yes. Um, our family's native. I'm not, but my husband and children are. And there's none of these problems. Uh, there's a lot of variety in native religions and societies as in regards to uh, gender. But in our particular one, there isn't these problems and the kids didn't grow up with any of those issues. So when they hear people say, and they've actually been at a rally where people were saying religion is part of the problem. And they said, not our religion. You know, you really have to decide. Um, you know, plus I just wanted to also say that many faith systems that are from the Judeo-Christian Islamo traditions have moved into being um, into equality. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a lot of same-sex marriages at the Pres at the uh, Presbyterian Church and at the uh, Episcopalian Church here. And the last point I want to make is the hierarchy and the clergy may be on, not necessarily the local priest or pastor, maybe on one side of the issue, the hierarchy and the, and the hoi polloi in the pews, the people in the pews are way ahead of them. When we had the fight for marriage equality in our state, the parents who were picking up their kids in the local parochial school had rainbow flags posted in their car windows and the children who were attending the parochial school had rainbow flags posted on their notebooks. So, and this is Catholic. So I think there's notice that, you know, whatever the hierarchy says or whatever the church rules are, doesn't necessarily mean the people in the pews agree with them are there. So thank you for listening. No, thank you. Lizzie. Hi. Um, yeah, that is some good um, information. I think there are, is a lot of variety there. Um, my question is, I wanted to uh, hear from you how you might uh, see the geography changing in the future nationally here in Florida. It, it, it's bad. And, um, you know, regarding the Supreme Court and what Clarence Tom, Judge Clarence Thomas said, and you know, it's just affecting a lot of people. You know, I'm an educator and like, I, you know, I just, I cannot, there just comes a time when you just cannot, you know, be a part of, of something that you, <laughs> that you think is just so, like you're, you're trying to work for change, but yet, you know, and so in our state, we're just seeing that in schools and athletics, you know, just, just everywhere across the board. And, and nationally, you know, I was in a meeting last night and a member really shared, you know, serious concern about the situation. And um, so I was just wondering what you thought about the change in geography in the future. Is everyone mute, muted? Hey, AJ is still on mute. You're still muted, AJ. Oh, you can hear he, Oh, okay. He said one moment. Thank you for bringing up that situation there in Florida. That is really concerning. Um, so thank you for bringing it up. Uh, I know one of the local school districts here just passed queer inclusive um, curricula, but here, unlike in Illinois, it's still a, a school by school thing, but in, in, in Florida, you can't do it at the local level anymore because the states superseded that. So it's really rough. Yeah, I, I just, all my books, all my, I mean, I'm, I'm with younger students now, but you know, I don't teach it, but yes, you know, you teach it. It's, it's everywhere. It's life. And, you know, the concerns about your, your job and your, it's just, it's, it's something you just can't participate in. It's, 
it's a sad situation here. But um, with the Supreme Court, I just know that nationally, there's a lot of people very concerned about what might, might come in the future, you know, from the Supreme Court. So check. Can you make me co-host and see if I can request it and see if it does it? You're just completely stuck. I was just going to say really quickly that um, we can also look abroad at places where things are much better than they are in the United States for ideas. Um, I know one thing uh, we got passed in Minneapolis was a zoning ordinance that made it illegal basically for a poly family to live in a single family zoned home. And now, of course, in Minneapolis, we don't have single family housing zoning at all. <laughs> Due to more recent updates that are environmentally inspired, but there are things like that that are there in many communities that people don't even realize are barriers for non traditional families. Can you use the chat? Is it letting you use the chat? Oh, he's like frozen. Okay. Um, well, let's see. Uh, is anyone else had any feedback? I can say something. Go ahead. Let me turn on my video so you can see me. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. I don't know if you can hear us, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, I teach at the college level, so I was having some ideas as she was talking. And uh, one class that I teach is very popular is world film, and I teach in their world languages and cultures department in an HBCU in North Carolina. So it's usually the class that fills up. <laughs> The Portuguese classes don't fill up like that. So I have uh, 30 students in Roto thinking of some ideas to, to use in the classroom. But for world film, I would need maybe a recommendation of a, an international movie that deals with the topic that we can discuss and you know, de develop some ideas and have a conversation. Because students are eager to talk about these things, but sometimes they need a little motivation. You know? So maybe through film, I was thinking it could be a start. And I was looking the other day because I went to the European Union recently to Brussels and I was learning about things they do there. And then I found a movie, it's a Portuguese movie, but it has a sad end. You know, it's about a poet who was gay. Unfortunately, he passed already, but young. Alberto is the name of the movie in case somebody has seen or is interested. But I, I was looking for a film, maybe a movie that has a happier ending. <laughs> and he was talking also about um, the prison system. Many of my students are very interested in do, in, in do research about the prison system. So if somebody has a recommendation of an internet, it, it can't be from the US, but it can be like a, maybe Indian American or Iranian American movie about something that I can you know, start a conversation with my students. That would be great. But yeah, thank you for the conversation. I enjoyed the presentation very much. Okay. Um, let me see, because I would have to uh, try to log in to stop the recording. Hold on. <laughs> Take it. Selena, I'm logging in right now, just so you know. This is Diana. Great, thank you, Diana.
Nia, you're now host again. <laughs> Um, are you able to stop the recording? Yes. So should I stop it now? Right there? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Because we probably have a lot of dead air now. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. This is good. <laughs> 